OK, welcome, everybody. We're at our second American Scouser podcast. Uh, we have Hillary Castles again with us. And for the first time, Kazi is with us. David, welcome. Thank you. Uh, so I wish after the first podcast, we were starting this one on a very positive and happy note. But after yesterday's misery, I don't think anybody's happy go lucky today. Um, so what did you guys think? I guess let's start with the elephant in the room because that was probably pretty ugly yesterday. Uh, let's start with you, Dave. What did you think of the game yesterday? Uh, well, where'd you start? Um, <laughs> lackluster. Um, lack of ideas. Uh, lack of invention. I thought, we were, I, I thought we were slow with the ball. I thought we got overrun in midfield. Um, I thought... A few plays were missing in a, such a huge game, which is really disappointing. I think that's probably the most disappointing, in my opinion, is that they went missing in the big game, which, of course, it's a huge game. Uh, you know, I think I think that's got to be the last time we see that midfield three together, playing together, in all honesty. I think I, I think that's it. Um, with the return of Kaita, Fabinho getting minutes. Of course, Fabinho... I think he's saving him for the Everton game, which I'm sure we're going to get on to. But, um, yeah, I think that's got to be the last time we see that midfield. So, it'll be interesting to see what you guys think. What did you think, Hillary? Um, Honestly, uh, I mean, other than the obvious points, um, it's just like uh, a lot. I, I was really... Uh, as I started watching it and, and we got even into the second half when things kind of started working for us a little bit, um, I was still questioning the lineup. Like I really just didn't understand. And um, I started to think we really could have used Trent. Um, but uh, I don't know, like it, it just is always that midfield question and uh, I thought Fabinho st- should have started. So um, I, I don't know. It's just that that lack of creativity, and it's like the only positives I could pull out of it were pretty much Mane and Robertson, and uh, I don't know. I thought it was an odd decision not to start Trent. I understand, you know, he's a lot less disciplined defensively. But I figured when you have a lazy forward like Neymar, who's not going to go back and was not going to track back, that's something we could have taken advantage of instead of parking Gomez there, who Neymar is going to be faster than whoever you put on him anyway. Uh, so I didn't understand why, you know, we we had Trent handle Sané. We had Trent handle a lot of top forwards last year, including like Cristiano Ronaldo. I don't know why we didn't trust them to handle Neymar. Yeah, I take that point. Um, I feel like he starts Lovren against Watford, and I, to me, I thought Lovren was brilliant against Watford. I thought he was probably our best defender. I know Virgil was brilliant, but I thought just to step in and not not have a lot of minutes and step in and play so well. I think he's thought. Well, I want to. I want to keep him in. We've just got a good clean sheet. It was a good win, you know. Let's keep him in. And I think he's tied to a, you know, accompany the Joe Gomez situation um, with Trent. Of course, in hindsight, the funny thing it looks like a, the wrong decision now. But in the past, when Gomez has played fullback and Dejan and Virgil have played together, it hasn't been bad. They've actually had good games together. In hindsight, of course, I would have started Trent. I agree with both of you guys. I think I would have started him. But, you know, I think with Dejan playing so well against Watford, kind of clouded his judgment, maybe, in starting him. Why do you guys think the midfield? I mean, when we, you know, obviously, that's the main complaint area <laughs> is the midfield. Because, I mean, in some ways, because it's three of the same guys, it feels like, just different shapes and sizes, but it's ultimately the, pretty much the same player overall. Um, but what is different from last year? Because this is the same, I know Ox was there as well, but this is pretty much the midfield that carried us last year all the way to the Champions League final and, you know, pretty good in the league for the most part. So how is that different this year than last year? 
it it almost seems like there's I don't know this is this is so horrible to say but it almost seems like we have this problem where now there's too many guys competing for those spots and I feel like there's not a real chemistry that connects all of them together like sometimes it just seems like like uh in the game yesterday um and and I honestly don't know what what Klopp's telling telling them like how Bobby was so far back and stuff and like Jeannie and and Milner were getting forward but it just it seems like they there's hardly anyone really connecting it's like it was almost all Robertson to to Mane uh I'd I'd have to go back and rewatch the game for the specific moments but there were just a lot of times where it's like we're not I don't know. I don't know if, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it's uh, the midfield. I think it's the most interesting one. I think I think that's Liverpool's biggest issue this season. I don't think Jordan Henderson's fit. I think that's the first thing that we have to take into account. You know, I think he's been struggling for his fitness all season, and you could see yesterday that he was non-existent in certain aspects of the game. I thought, you know, Verratti, of course. We should have been sent off, and I'm sure we're going to get into that as well. But he kind of dominated them. Um, he, he looked, he didn't look, he looked, he looked on the 70th minute like he couldn't run, which is surprising for Jordan because he's someone who never stops running. So when he is slowing down and when he is feeling the pace of the game, you do re- re- recognize it a lot more. Um, I thought the early booking for Genie kind of stifled his game a bit because, of course, he didn't want to get the sending off. He got booked, and I think it was like maybe 30 seconds to a minute later, he does another foul in the first half, and you're just like, you know, keep your head, keep calm. And I think that's kind of stifled his game as well. Um, for me, I just think the midfield just lacks creativity. I just think it lacks invention. Um, I think they are a very, very workmanlike team. I think it could do a job away from home when you're trying to get a draw or see a game out. I think about for Liverpool... For them to Liverpool to challenge for the league and the Champions League, that could not be the the, the starting three midfield going on, in my opinion. But I mean, that's the and doesn't look like it. But I don't know. Like I say, there there has to be. It feels like I know. Uh, are we just not as miraculous up front as we were last year? Maybe we were. You know, those three guys were so on fire. It kind of. Kind of like hid or you know swept it under the carpet that we had no creativity in midfield because uh, it's not like we had ox all the way through either. Um, but yeah, I think we will probably see some changes. You would think for this Everton game coming up, which probably we'll get to next. Going back to what you were talking about, what was up with the refereeing? I mean, if it wasn't for the guy behind the goal, we were not even getting the penalty. <laughs> I am um, yeah. I can let Hillary take that one if you want. <laughs> before, I'm, just, I'm going to try and compose the language before I answer that question. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Is it the money? I mean, it was just, I mean, at this point, who doesn't know about, you know, Neymar's acting and pretty much the entire Brazilian national team, really? Um, I just don't understand how the referees don't kind of you know, nip it in the butt before it starts. I mean, that guy is rolling around since the World Cup. And you would think at this point, or I think Klopp was talking about in the press conference, they should almost be something for uh, exaggerating the injury. Could they come up with a rule like that, you guys think, where... You know, you're rolling around like you just shot one second and then you're sprinting down the field. I, mean, I don't know how that would work where they would come back and say, well, you were acting like 30 seconds ago. But it almost sounds like there has to be something about, uh, I, don't know, I don't know if people act like they need medical help and stop the game. Uh, they can't come in for like a full minute or something like that. I don't know how that will be monitored. I'm just throwing crazy ideas out there now off the top of my head. But it almost seems like that's something like the support has to come up with something to stop the overreacting of like players to fouls. 
Yeah, it's. I think with the Neymar situation, of course, you know, I think he's a, the man has talent that you can dream of. I think he's got all the talent to be one. To, I know he's one of the best footballers right now in the world, but I mean to win the Ballon d'Or and go and win his country a World Cup, of course, and that's always going to be damaged by his play acting and things. I'm, I'm kind of, I agree with that we need something to happen. But in the um, where the play acting, if you're gonna maybe even stop the clock, um, I'm not sure. I don't know how you can stop it. But in a Liverpool sense, to be honest, I wish some of our players would do it. I'm not saying play acting, but I'm saying a bit of time wasting. You know, like the PSG players yesterday were time wasting so much, and they were moaning at the referee, getting in his face, putting some pressure on. Feels like Liverpool teams sometimes are too nice. You know, we we kind of. I we like that little sp- I like that little spite in the team. I like the team to, you know, time waste, take your time, no rush, get in the referee's face, try and force decisions, because this is a team who've won every single game in the league this season. Um, that they, of course, this is their only competition they really play in, because they're going to win the other two competitions probably by <laughs> February anyway. They're going to win the cup and they're going to win the league, and it's, you know, this is all they've got really. Um, Yesterday, they had the pressure on to deliver. They could have went out yesterday, of course, if Liverpool beat them. They had the pressure on to deliver, and they made every single tactic and every single thing in their favour, and it worked. So I kind of haven't really got a massive issue with it. Um, I can I just take in, into account of what they are actually doing. And I think the referee's got to be a bit wiser. I think the referee, I think I believe he only had it on four or five minutes. You know, it was easily seven or eight minutes at least before, you know, taking into consideration... The substitutions as well. I think one of the substitutions that I counted must have lasted 90 seconds for the player to get off the field. So I think the referee's got to be a bit wiser and a bit cleverer, or maybe the fourth official in that case. But yeah. I mean, I would argue that if Gomez was Brazilian, Verratti got a record. Because uh, he would not get up. Like, if that was Neymar, he's not getting up. He's rolling all over the place and like, you know, like he got shot and probably getting a red card for the opponents. Whereas Gomez getting up, I think the, the part of the, the Premier League being more physically demanding and more tough kind of hurts these, you know, British teams in the European championships because that mentality carries over and A, they get cards a lot easier, I believe, and B, they don't... Uh, cost the opponent cars as easy because they try to top things out instead of like over extending and acting it out. I can't think of a lot of teams in the Premier League that would act like PSG players, but I can come up with other teams around Europe that would do the same thing. So I don't know if that's a Premier League has to get better in acting or I don't know what the solution to that is, but I think it kind of hurts the Premier League that it's a lot more physically demanding league as a whole. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm a, I, I agree what you're saying. I think with Joe, I think what he's got to realise is that, again, it's been a bit cleverer, as I said before. It's been just wait five or six seconds, let our, our play, like Virgil was straight there, and I think Jordan was pressuring the referee, pre- pressuring him. He, he jumped straight back up, which kind of makes it look like, you know, it wasn't much of a bad tackle. It was a horrendous tackle. It was an, an horrendous, horrifically bad tackle. You know, of course, he should have been sent off. And I'd probably agree on the Neymar thing. But is that is that clever from Neymar or naive from Liverpool? You know, I passed it on to Hillary. So I think it's I think it's I think it's very clever from Neymar by what he does. But again, I also think it's naive from Liverpool by not doing the same. So maybe I'm wrong. I mean, I think that I think that Neymar is a bit ridiculous. Um I, the the theatrics and everything are completely unnecessary. I think there's a way to be smart about taking uh, taking opportunities um, that present themselves without looking like you're on a stage. <laughs> um, but I, I I'm the I'm an idealist, and I I don't think that that. My my personal feeling would be I would not want my team to to fake anything and to be 
to be anywhere close to that theatrical uh, thing. Obviously, we should take um, take opportunities that are handed to us, mm-hmm. and and obviously in situations where we deserve them. Um, but I wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> I would be ashamed if any of our players acted remotely close oh. to what he acts like. And yeah, I, yeah, that's like the dilemma there. It's like, you know, where do you draw the line? I mean, I have daughters who play soccer and I mean, I have taught them some of this stuff. Like, how do you get a call? I mean, I thought, I mean, they're both, you know, kind of like me on the shorter. Well, I'm not as petite as I used to be, but they definitely are. And, <laughs> you know, so they get pushed around the field a lot. And sometimes they don't get those calls. And I was like, well, it is how you get the calls. You know, you yell every once in a while when you get pushed. Instead of trying to toughen up and standing up, you take the dive and you fall on the ball or you grab the ball as you come down. You know, like little tricks to the game, which are kind of like dirty tricks, but it's part of the game, but it shouldn't be a part of the game. I, I, it's almost like I felt bad teaching that stuff, but it's stuff, it's life skills on the soccer field in a way. Well, I mean, the 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 officials are are human too they're gonna make mistakes or they're gonna see certain things and not other things and so a player always has to kind of you know gauge gauge that stuff but you're never gonna have the same official in the same situation so it's always gonna be different i mean you see these guys go up to them with the the scratches on their stomachs from the the cleats are like the torn shirts or stuff and nothing happens. So, I mean, it really just is so dependent on the situation. I mean, but I mean, you could just roll around on the ground in every situation and hope for the best. Uh, but, I, but it doesn't seem to work that much anymore. Yeah, for me, I just think, I, I just want Liverpool to be a bit cleverer. You, uh, you know, we call, you know, in the UK, we call it the dark hearts. Of football, and it's just like <laughs> yeah. it is basically using the dark art of football. You try and take everything you can because football's changed a lot in 15 20 years. You know, it's not about these big stand up, you know, like you know, your Jamie Carragher's, your Steven Gerrard's who are prepared for battle, you know, you know, Carragher versus Drogba when I was growing up, and things like that. When you have these big titanic battles, it's not like that anymore. It's about how can you get the most and about how you can get your team to win, it's not about anything else. It's about what you can get off the referee and how you get your team to win. And they took every chance yesterday. Now, the one way to, say, to for me to stop it is if the fourth official holds up, holds up nine to ten minutes injury time and they all go, wait, wait there, where, 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 where's that come from? And you can go, well, he was rolling around on the floor for two minutes. That guy over there was doing the same. I think that's the only way you kind of can stop it um, is by applying the right amount of injury time in effect of, well, there's your punishment, but it's just going to add all the time on that you're wasting right now. We're still going to play the full 90 minutes. But I, I think that's the only way you can do it, really. That's actually a good idea. Almost have the fourth referee almost have a stopwatch where he just like presses it whenever the game stops on his side and then says, hey, that was exactly like eight minutes. So here we go. Eight more minutes to make up for the last time. Yeah. That's the only, that's the only way I can think because, you know, it's hard if a player, if a player is really injured. You know, and of course, the time 100% should be stopped anyway. Of course, we've got to trust the officials that they're getting the time right. But we know both, both for us, sorry, us three guys know watching that game yesterday. There was no way there was four or five minutes. There was just no way. There was at least four or five minutes just in the first half. There was three goals in the first half. So, I, you know, that's something I always look for for the fourth official anyway. But I think that is the only way you can stop it, in my opinion. Yeah. There you go. Second podcast, we saw one of soccer's biggest problems. <laughs> Here we go. So, well, let's solve some Liverpool problems. So, well, going into this weekend, Hillary, so how do you think that lineup is going to change facing Everton? You know, I really have no idea anymore. Well, how Just... would you like it to change? Let's go that way. God knows what's <laughs> up Um, I mean, I think that um, I would, I would just go with what has been working for us, which, um, you know, Trent, uh, Dejan, um, Virgil, Robertson, um, and then for the midfield, I would do probably Shakiri, uh, Fabinho, and Milner, 
And then the front three, Mane, uh, I don't know. Bobby is kind of, but yeah, I, I guess I would start him. And um, Salah. That's not the tricky thing about this game, I think, is the fact that we got Burnley coming up right after. I mean, we only have like two off days in between. So it's almost like, I mean, I know Klopp always says, you know, it's the next game. We don't think about the game afterwards. But you would almost think in his head he has a roster starting lineup for this game in mind, bearing in mind another starting lineup to start against Burnley, you know, barring any injuries. Well, the last, I think it was, you know, on the last podcast, but on the last game uh, or our last uh, league uh, match against Everton, it was the same thing. Right, it was like we had the the Champions League game yeah. really right after it, and so it was it was a, a a really different lineup for that game. Yeah, I think I I think I think it's tough. I think with Henderson suspended, I think of course Fabinho comes back in. I'd start Gomez centre back. I'd play Trent, but I would also I would start Dejan Lovren centre back against Burnley. I think I think that's more of a battle, you know, playing against Ashley Barnes and Sam Vokes than Richarlison, who's probably going to try and turn you know, and he's going to be a bit quicker. So I think Joe Gomez's pace would be massive, centre back. So I think I think Dejan would start for me against Burnley midfield. Now I would completely change it. I'd put Shakiri and Kite in it. I would play Kite on the left hand side behind Mane. Um, I I think. I think I've seen a stat today that he made more dribbles uh, in the last 20 minutes of him coming on than Milner, Wijnaldum and Henderson did in the whole game against PSG. Yeah, I saw that. That's pretty scary. Uh, you know, I think he has to play. I, I really do. I think the only thing that scares me about the, the Kaiser situation is that he's not fit. And, but he has to play one of these two games. And I would not want to play him on a Tuesday against Burnley. I, I just, I will, oh, sorry, a midweek game against Burnley. I just wouldn't. Especially with the, how Burnley play, how rough they are, and that that pitch is very enclosed. It's going to be very cold. Trust me, <laughs> Burnley in December is cold. <laughs> right, I can definitely clarify that. And the last game we played against them, it was a horrible game. I think we won two one, as you know, Raggy Clavin writing his name into folklore history. Um, so yeah, I just think you know, I, 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 that's why I would, that's why I would play Kaita now, and I would bring Milner back in for the, the Burnley game. So you're doing Fabinho, Shakiri, Keita in midfield for the Everton game? Yeah, and I'd leave for Burnley. I would bring in back in Henderson because, of course, the ban. Um, and I would bring back in Milner. I just think, with the, and I'd leave Shakiri. I just think we need that. I need the creativity of Shakiri, especially with set pieces. You know, we can, the guy's got a great left foot for the free kick in his corners. I just think we're going to need a lot of tough, strong, physical game against Burnley. And I don't think we're going to get that out of Everton. I really don't. I think Everton are going to try and come and try and play some football, which is just going to play into Liverpool's hands perfect. Speaking of uh, uh, like corner kicks and like taking these like stop kicks, we did a terrible job on set pieces against PSG. And honestly, the last few games, we've had the worst corner kicks ever. And I have no idea. Regardless of who's taking it, they seem like we seem to be getting nothing out of it, especially in games where we had, you know, we had Lauren in there. We had like, you know, Van Dyke in there. You would think we would get a lot more out of these corner kicks or, you know, chances to put the ball in the box. And we almost seem to get nothing. We get more out of opponents' corner kicks as counters. I would argue that we get out of our own corner kicks sometimes. When did Salah start taking corner kicks? <laughs> no, I'm just wondering when, when it started. I, I don't remember. I don't, but I think it should end. Uh, <laughs> no. Well, I, I'm wondering if that has anything to do with it because he's always he always has like three people on him, no matter where he is. And I feel like, you know, we're we're missing out on that. Uh, take advantage of it. I. It's just I feel like. I mean, apart from like when Milner 
comes in front of that ball, I don't get that anticipation like of something's going to happen. And Shakira is the other example. Like, you know, unless one of them is taking the free kick, I just don't get that it's about to happen feeling. Uh, I just feel like we're just throwing another ball in the box. And, and sometimes I don't even understand, you know, are we trying to chip it from the front post, but there's nobody there? Is it just... Are these corner kicks really that bad where they're all falling short and never getting past the first guy? It's just been, I know to me it's frustrating because we've, knock on wood, solved the problem defending against them for the most part. Uh, except, you know, we did a bad job in the Red Star game. But it's just I just feel like we don't get enough out of them offensively. Yeah, I I feel like we're kind of missing something. I'm not, I... I I do think they are meant to have a man from post to get the, the flick on. But when you've got a guy the size of Virgil or a guy the size of Lovren and these big, tall, strong guys, I just think that you just got to swing the ball in the box. Nothing special, nothing fancy. Just beat the first man. And with a few of our corners in the last, probably since the start of the season, a lot of our corners at the first man. And it's just, I agree with you. It's the most frustrating, I think. Especially when, of course, yesterday you're 2-1 down away from home. You know, you're not playing well. And your best chance you're going to get to score is a set piece. And you think, just at least deliver a couple of good crosses in. Put the goalkeeper under pressure. Put one right under, under the goalkeeper's nose and go, well, you've got, you know, put two men on him and go, you've got to come and cast the ball. Put, just put the pressure right on him. You know, we can go off the defender and go in. It doesn't matter how it goes in. I think we're trying to be a bit too clever on the corners. A bit too cute, a bit too precise. When I think for me, you just got to swing the ball on the, on, the, on the penalty box or under the keeper's nose and go, let them deal with it and see what happens, really. We had that late, that late one um, where, uh, was it, uh, Lovren got back there and got it, but they, yeah, uh, Virgil yeah. had taken that guy down. Yeah. That was the only kind of good set piece we had all game, I think. Yeah, it was. Really. <laughs> I, I mean, we don't seem to have at games like yesterday where, yeah, we're not playing well, um, but we can we had the opportunity to throw numbers. It was obvious that PSG was like, let's hang on to this and just you know hoping on counters, which they have the people to counter. But you know, we just don't have a plan B when we need goals like that. Uh, like we don't have the. I mean, they had a, you know, I didn't get to watch the Manchester United game, uh, but, you know, I saw the scoreline. I didn't even see the goal, but I could already imagine, like, what happened towards the end of the game. They put Lukaku and Fellaini in the middle and just kept, like, chugging balls in the middle and hoping those guys bring it down to somebody. I mean, it just feels like when we are struggling to score and opening up a defense like we were yesterday, we don't have a plan B. We can't say, you know what, we're going to do this style now. Because we don't have that number nine that we can put in there to, you know, harass the defense or, you know, take away a couple of big bodies to open up some space for the wing guys. We just don't have, you know, I think the hope was Solanke could be that guy, uh, but I, he's not getting the opportunity, so I'm assuming he's not there yet. Yeah, I, I feel with Liverpool, especially with the plan B, I think that's a fair argument, especially. I just think... I don't know if Dom Solanke and Divock Origi must be one of the, some of the worst players at Liverpool because how they do not get minutes when you are six foot one, six foot two, both of you are quick, you got a nice touch. H- how you just don't get enough minutes is, is beyond me. Now I'm not saying that you know the bad players. I, I actually think they're okay to good players. Do I think they're overall good enough for Liverpool? No, but do I think they could be a great second option off the bench? Of course. And the, the game yesterday kind of sees that. You know, I look. I think for Solanke, I think we, I think it kind of it's written on the wall. When in the Champions League final, you are Jurgen Klopp has one sub left, and he doesn't bring him on, and he just stays with the two subs. I think that says it all for me. I think then I'll be going back to my agent on the next day and go, I need a way out, because you're the only striker, and he didn't get on, and he still had the sub left, which is <laughs> kind of says it all. Um, now with Divock Origi, he gets a few minutes against Red Star away from home. Um, but that game was dead um, at the time when he came on I think the plan B I don't know what that's going to be to be honest I think you know Ox of course we're missing Oxley Chamberlain massively um, you know we had Coutinho leaving January 
and then Oxley Chamberlain start finding form around January. So it was like we didn't really miss him, miss the Coutinho situation. I think a lot of people, Liverpool fans especially, have forgot that. Is that when Oxley Chamberlain was finding form, we lost Coutinho and Oxley Chamberlain just sat right back in. And it was like, you know, okay, he worked a lot harder than Coutinho. You know, we tracked back a lot more and he had a lot more defensively, which might made us more solid. But I think he was kind of the. I think he's the kind of the plan B that we are missing, to be honest, especially in a, a, a games away from home when we're struggling to get out and we're struggling to drive forward. I think he is our plan B, really. And, you know, you look at the midfield yesterday, I mean, that's what we miss. I mean, the pace of our midfield yesterday is pretty much non existent. They're all at like a medium. I mean, when Genie is your fastest guy in midfield, <laughs> uh, you know, you don't have a fast midfield. So, so going against Everton. I'm almost. I almost think Genie will still be in there because Club will want to have a familiar face who's familiar with the midfield. Maybe play Genie and Genie as the six and have Keita and Shakiri. But I don't know if that gives too much space to Everton. Yeah, I feel. I feel like. We're, yeah, the only thing I'm worried about is the um, is Gilfi. Gilfie Sigurds, and I think he's the only one I'm worried about. Um, he's the only one he's actually got a bit of form. I think he scored six and eight. Uh, he's the only one that really for Everton. And I think with Genie, Owen Milner can do a job on him. So they can just do like a man marking job. I think because uh, for me, I watch a lot of I watch a lot of Everton um, just so I can laugh, really. Um, <laughs> yeah, the hatred still runs true, don't worry. Um, so and I watch a lot of. And he's the only one who looks like a very tardy. Of course, with Charleston's very, he's been playing really well. He's a very good player, but it all goes through Gilfie. And I think I think if you can trust Ronaldo or Miller to do that job, of course you have got to play them. The only thing is with the Genie situation, he's played a lot of football this year. I don't know how many games he's played, but it seems like to me he started probably every game, if maybe not one or two. He's played a lot of football. I think he's probably made more fo- uh, most football like Van Dijk and Allenson. That's my true, yeah. You know, so I think there has to be a point where you rest them. Now, if you do it against Burnley, of course, that's fine. You know, then you've got United, I believe, um, coming up in a couple of weeks. So I think he's going to need a rest soon. That's why I think you can't afford to rest them against Everton. I think because Everton will come out and play football and they will want to get the foot on the ball because they will not want to change. Marco Silva will not want to change the style. I think that plays into Liverpool's hands to get more space, get Shaqiri on the ball, get Kite and they can drive and runs. I think that's the biggest key for us. So let me ask you guys this. Uh, obviously, we got two games coming up back to back. I think since the Burnley game is Tuesday, we do have some time before the Bournemouth game. But uh, you got to figure that's going to be only three days before the Napoli game. So we will see some unfamiliar faces out there pretty soon. With I would think maybe I don't know if it's starting this game, but definitely starting the Burnley game. So, Hillary, when do you expect some Moreno Klein sightings on the field? Well, <laughs> never. <laughs> one hopes. No, not uh, when, one hopes. It's when, when do you expect to see it? <laughs> For another team, maybe in January? <laughs> um. Oh gosh! <laughs> you would think it's coming, right? I mean, it has to be. Yeah. If they're yeah. going to ever see the field, it's going to be within these two weeks. I, this is going to be their Christmas. I'm sure uh, Al Albi is going to be starting one of those games. Oh, um, God. Just because I Klopp, I know he's going to do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Klein, I think is interesting because you brought him up in the last podcast. Um, and uh, I I don't know. I, I think that he would probably... Do, do you really shudder away at him starting as, as the same way that you do? No. <laughs> no, I just want to see no. alive and well and playing <laughs> soccer again. <laughs> but, 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 uh, so I don't think I'd be as, you know, worried when I see him in his lineup as I do with Moreno. And, and I feel bad for Moreno in some ways. I mean, I think he has talents, uh, but man, some of the mistakes, I don't think he's just like very top level, ready, no, left he, back. He can have a really great 30 minutes. It's the next, you know, uh, 
the rest of the mm-hmm. game that is the concerning part. Um, he has these brain farts, and uh, and the moments he has it is always costly. Uh, I don't know yeah. why, but his brain farts always cost, or uh, he has them at like the worst time. I don't know what it is, but I mean, his lapses on getting back or overrunning a pass, whatever it may be, it seems like it always costs us as a goal. Yeah, I think it would. I agree with. The, I think the Klein. I would keep. I would keep Klein round. Um, you know, Klein can play left back as well, which he has done early on. Joe Gomez has played left back. People forget that he played that under Brendan Rodgers when he first came in. That's where he was playing for a while. Um, so we have options there. With Moreno, I, and this, uh, my personal opinion on Moreno is, I think he's a good left back. He's just not good enough for Liverpool. If he was playing for a bottom ten side in the Premier League. People would look at him and go, he's a, he's a good player. He looks a bit tired, you know, he's good on the ball, he can shoot, he's got a great left foot. But he's not. A t- when you're playing at Liverpool, every single game is scrutinised. Every single game is on TV. Every single pundit is talking about it. Because it's, of course, one of the biggest teams in the world. And that's the issue with Alberto Moreno. You cannot hide. So when you make a little mistake, I remember when we signed uh, Robbie Keane for Liverpool. You can play, when you're at Tottenham, you can play... You can play well one of three or four games and you can go missing in a couple of games and it wouldn't really get scrutinised. It's a bit like the Alberto Moreno situation. You'll play well one of five, but the other four, you can go missing or you'll make a mistake. We can get away with that in the bottom 10 Premier League. For me, I do think he's going to play some minutes. I I would not play him against Bournemouth away. Um, I think he was playing left back when we lost 4-3 there. And I think Ryan Fraser come off the bench and destroyed him. And now he's a better player now than he was then. So I think that could be a nightmare for him. Um, I, I don't know where he gets minutes but I do believe that Robinson does need a rest so it's a tricky one really it really is a tricky one um, on the Daniel Klein also and I'm not sure if he's is he still alive I don't know um, so we're still investigating that so I brought okay. it up in the first podcast we're, I'm still looking into it so awesome he must be he must be he must, be, he must make great cups of tea because <laughs> I, I don't know what else he does he must be great on like the, the, like the DJ in the dressing room, <laughs> because I can't think what else he does. He doesn't play football, does he? Um, he's on he's that. Po- he's on that for love of hip hop show. Oh, for the love of God! Only oh, <laughs> <laughs> you doing? Um, it's kind of says it all, really, doesn't it? But um, no, I like the final clan. I think again, he's a top. Fo- I think he really is a top fullback. I just think the problem is, is that we've this team's matured without him when he's been out injured. It's it just moved on. I think that's the same with Moreno. I think it's the same with De Vocariga. I think the, the, the teams just move on. Lalana, in my opinion. They just feel like the yesterday's men. But I do think if, if, you, if Klan is going to play, it has to be it has to be in the next five or six games. He has to get at least you know, an hour here and there. He has to give our, our guys a rest, really. Well, let's keep going with the horror theme then. And let me guys ask this. Do we see Mignolet in one of these four games coming up? No. Again, I'm not asking, do you want to see Mignolet? <laughs> you don't think we, you know, can Klopp go back from his word of goalkeepers reading and rest when he benched Mignolet last year uh, and play like Allison every game? I I would play Allison. Um, even if he had two broken hands over Mignolet. <laughs> I, I, I think... I, th- I think with Mignolet, again, he's a good goalkeeper. He's not actually a bad goalkeeper. No. It's a bit like the Moreno situation, though. You get scrutinised because you're playing for Liverpool. You're not at, a to- you're not at Sunderland anymore, but you can make eight, game- eight saves, nine saves a game because that's what you are doing at, that- at them kind of clubs because you get loads of shots at you. At Liverpool, you don't do that. The prime example is if you look at Alisson against Watford, the saves he makes, the- 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 that save he makes from uh, um, Pereira, he keeps Liverpool in the game. He made one save, and it was a brilliant save all game. That's all he had to do, but that's what we need you for. We don't need you making eight nine saves a game because we're never going to have eight nine shots against us. So no, I think I would never. I wouldn't play Mignolet anymore. I I think I also think it's a trust issue with the defence. I think we've seen it against Chelsea in the League Cup. I just think it's a trust issue. Um, you know Virgil Van Dijk. Dejan and Lovren, Gomez, Ducati, Robertson, they've all got these relationships now together. So I think if you're going to start making two or three changes at one time, or even, especially with the goalkeeper, 
you know, I mean, Van Dyke, if you're the main centre back, you don't know when he's coming. You don't know when he's going. Is he coming for this corner? Is he not? Um, I don't think his distribution is good enough. Like Allison can get us away with his throws or his kicking. So I would never play Mignolet again, to be honest. Yeah, I think he's one of those goalies that is probably not built for a top team in the sense that, you know, there are certain goalies that need to be kept busy to get the most mm-hmm. out of them. Yeah. Uh, they can't keep their concentration on a team like Liverpool or Chelsea or, you know, like City where, you know, you're not going to see that much of the ball, but you got to keep your focus because, yeah, you need to make that crucial save to keep your team in the game. Yeah, I mean, he's made, even yesterday, really, that game could have got out of control. Uh, he had quite a f- good few yeah. saves and really the both goals, I know what he could have done um, with any of them. He did have that was yesterday's game, wasn't it? It seems like this since uh, time ago. Uh, he tried one of these trick moves again yesterday and almost cost. Was that yeah. the second half? I said yesterday. I think. Uh, uh, no, I was, was that was. <laughs> I can't remember. They're I all rolling into one. But he did some like a funky pass to. I don't know if it was back to Gomez again. It was to his right, and I want to say it was the second half. Where I was like, Ugh, not a good time for this because I think at the time, obviously, the game was only two um, one. Yeah. But at this point, yeah, I mean, I think he's the best option. I just am more afraid and worried, I guess, that we might see Mignolet to give oh. us a breather. I know I got you worried. Now you won't sleep tonight. Um, not, oh my god, <laughs> uh, it gives you nightmares. You know what? Like, yeah, I, to be fair, again, he's a good goalkeeper. He really is. But he's just not good enough for Liverpool. The game, again, I think the team's just moved on. It's mature without him. And he's had... I think he's been at Liverpool for like five years. I can't... You know, it, how many chances does this guy want? Um, every time you've been called upon, you, it's some, you've made, you have made mistakes in the past. OK, you've kept us in games. You've made, I, you know, under Brendan Rodgers when we were going for the league title. I thought he was actually really good that season. I know he made a couple of mistakes, but what goalkeeper doesn't? Alisson's made a mistake this season against Leicester. You know, so what this guy is being called upon and called upon. He had the run of games last season. Um, he brought Carrius back in. Before that, when he um, Carrius at the Howard against Bournemouth, um, he brought Mignolet back in after that. The guys had chances, and he just can't nail down the, um, the first team spot. So it'd be interesting to see what Hillary thinks. But for me, it's it's definitely a no. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a no. <laughs> it's a hard no. <laughs> Um, Not only did I express my concerns uh, in the last podcast with the goal differential, but also with the, um, yeah, Seamus agrees with me, Um, with the the points, uh, you you were like, we're we're, going to win on points. You put Mignolet in, I really, like, there's, it's just, I'm very stressed out about both of those things. Um, So I just think that it's it's Allison all the time, you know. Like 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 you said, if he's got two broken hands, put him in. Yeah, yeah. Without having access to Google, which I do, but what would you guys? How big would you guys say Simon Mignolet is and Allison is height wise? Just I, off the top of your head. I I, I I've got a funny four. feeling that they're the same size. But go on, you can go ahead, Lily. I've got a funny feeling the same size, six two maybe. Yeah, I feel like Alisson's probably like two inches taller than him. That's what I would have guessed too. <laughs> According to this, uh, Mignolet is six four, and Alisson is six three. And the wow. way they play, I'm with you, Hillary. I would have guessed that Alisson is like two three inches taller. Wow. Just the way they come out for balls, and I, I'm like I said, I always thought that was one of Mignolet's weaknesses. Maybe he has T-Rex arms or something. Because, I mean, it's just... <laughs> I'd always felt like his size was not adequate to come out and grab some of those balls and, you know, or be able to command the box when he comes out. And maybe it's just more like a power thing more than height. But I'm actually shocked to see that Mignola is it taller. Could be, like, the center of gravity, too. like the. It's something, because he can't come out and get balls. <laughs> he must wear heels. Because <laughs> there's no way. <laughs> I think that's all about commanding, though. It's about your aura. 
I think you know it's about when you walk to a room, your demeanour, your attitude. You know, Alison, Alison, Alison walked in in the summer and said, "I'm the I'm the best goalkeeper. I'm the best goalkeeper you could have signed." And he's acted like it and he's delivered. I think it's all about that. I think it's about how you carry yourself. And Alison's carried himself, you know, impeccably. Of course, he came in after Carrius. You know, we we talk about Alison having broken hands. Carrius has no hands, so he didn't really have a lot to improve on. But the man is just another level. He's just another. He's, for me, he's probably the best since Pepe Reina. That easy, um, and Pepe's probably the best we've had for 25, 30 years. So I think he's that good. So let's get some predictions for the first Everton game. And then I guess we'll get to the Burnley game because our next podcast will be right after the Burnley game. Hopefully we'll, be, we'll answer it happier than we answered this one. So, <laughs> Dave, we'll start with you. What you got for the Everton game? I've, got, I've, got, I've watched a lot of games. I've been to a lot of Everton games where they brought really, really good teams and they just swallowed and they bottled it. And Liverpool have overran them and overworked them. And I've got a funny feeling if Liverpool score in the first 10 minutes, we could we could win this 3 or 4 nil. I, I, I don't think they'll score. I, um, I think it's about Liverpool. I think this could be the game that, you know, the old false dawn of this could kick, kick start the season and kick start the front three. But I think when you beat Everton, it really does give you something. I felt that when um, Mane scored at Christmas last year, it felt like, OK, this is a good, you know, it can really kick it on. I just got a few. I think I, I'm gonna. I'll say. I'll say three nil, comfortably. You already. What was your prediction, Hillary? My prediction. Or, or has or... it changed since we came up with? Because I know we threw out some uh, early predictions in the last podcast. Uh, I know I was at four one. Um, has yours changed because of the game yesterday or still the same? Yeah, I, I would say it's a little bit different. Um, what did I say? 3-1? I believe so. I know yeah. I was at 4-1, which was a shocker. So. I would, yeah, I would, I don't know. I feel like it would be 2-0. I'm with Dave in terms of I'm hoping they make this a statement game to after, you know, the comeback. Um, I just don't know how much this roster is going to change to be able to make a healthy prediction, I guess. Same goes for the Burnley game after that. We just don't know who's going to be out there. But regardless, I mean, when we entered the season, we talked about now we have a squad with deeper and everything like that. So it should not be as much of an issue. But I feel like the biggest thing we missed between this year and last year, I think you were talking about this earlier, Hillary, is we had the same lineup, not by choice, but for lack of options at all times. So there was a lot better chemistry. I feel like the moment we changed, like we saw in the FA Cup, uh, well, the League Cup, I'm sorry, you change three, four players and it just collapses. It becomes very, very disconnected. I'm just afraid of scenarios like that where we're trying to rest people and throwing some new names out there. I mean, do we see Lalana on Saturday or maybe Tuesday? You would think we would. Mm, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Does yeah. anybody know that I gather? <laughs> no, I like I like Lalana. I think again he's a good player. I just don't I just don't see where he gets his minutes. Um you know, I'd start with Bournemouth. I think that's more of a game, of course, I know he's from down there as well. I think he is a Bournemouth lad. And I think they are very nice to play against. You know, they're not going to be flying into tackles. They give you space. They give you time to play. And I think that I think he'd look great against Bournemouth. So that's where I would play him. Um, I would not play him in the Merseyside derby. It's just not that this game. It, to me, I, to me, it's the biggest game of the season. Of course, you know, being from the city, and I know Man United and City are big games now. But it's always Everton. Always Everton. Everything is everything. If you beat everything, if you beat everything, you're fine for three months as a manager. <laughs> it, 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 like I can give you a pass. If you be like you know, getting clock as soon as man, I knocked that ball in the ninety first minute against them. He had a pass for six months, so I'm cool with it. Just please, I think also based on last year, I think Jurgen owes us one. I remember he rested players last year. I think Mane and Firmino start on the bench. I think you know he started Solanke up front on his own. So I think. 
he does always one at Anfield especially. So I'm hoping he just goes full strength. I would, as I say, I play Sh- Shakiri and Kaita. Let's just go at them and let's just see if we can just bring up some demons of the, you know, the beatings that we give them over the years. So that's what I'm hoping. I think, especially the Everton game. I hope we go out with our regular defense and everything and kind of like go at him. And then I think, yeah, using Lauren and Burnley. Burnley away games are always tough because it's just so physical. I mean, that's the game. Yeah, you definitely don't want Lalana out in that game because then he'll end the season again. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, and the same thing, with, same thing with Keita. I mean, that's probably <clears throat> you want your muscle out there like Milner and Genie and uh, Henderson. I hate to say, but there you go. You just have the same midfield that we complain about again when you want the muscle out there. Yeah, I'd, I, for me, against Burnley, I'd play for I'd play for Benio and I'd play Henderson. I'd play both, and I'd play like maybe um, Shakiri in like the number eight role, or sorry, um, the number ten role. Um, and I'd go to four two three one, um, and I would just hope that we can just out muscle them, out work them with Pavinio and Henderson, because that's one thing that we haven't seen. Yeah, is them two playing alongside each other, especially in away games, um, especially in tough away games. So we we'll look at Burnley. You know, we, of course, going to City is going to be completely different. But you look at United, you know, United play the same as Burnley anyway. So, I, I, for me, I would play both of them. But, again, that's a kind of up for discussion, really. And I think that's, I mean, that lineup, for example, I think would be very interesting. The one you just said with Henderson and Fabinho with Shakira up front. And that's when I think you're kind of like relying on the front four to go get you some goals. And I think we could do that last year. I, to me, like when I was asking earlier, the difference between this midfield and last midfield, like last year's midfield, I think the difference is kind of like the front up front, that they cannot get those goals as like they did last year, uh, where we could rely on, you know, having the four out. It was almost like, you know, we were more worried about defense. We were like, they're going to score anyway, just don't get scored on. Whereas this year... The front three, especially Firmino's effectiveness, is a lot less than last year. I know he's still getting his goals here and there and stuff, but I just think the front three, we're not getting as much out of offense, which exposes the midfield more. I think they could hide behind the front's effectiveness last year, whereas they're kind of getting exposed, but we're like, well, they're not creating anything. I think they didn't need to last year because the front three constantly were. Whereas we're not as much up front now, it feels like. Like we're, you know, Salah always has like three guys on top of him. Uh, Mane has been the only bright spot, maybe partially because people are shifting over to Salah's side more. But I feel like Mane has created a lot more than last year. And I'm probably the most critical of Mane, especially on his passing and, you know, overall, like, you know, he's more selfish than probably others compared to Firmino and Salah. So you guys think Firmino starts against Everton or. Are we testing out Sturridge out there? Who did very well against Everton? Uh, yeah. Was that last year? Yeah. Um, yeah. Last, no, not last year. year before. Okay, he played really well. Um, he scored a couple of goals against Everton. Um, the Sturridge situation is interesting because you can't... I don't think you can go... I don't think you can go Firmino on the Sunday and Firmino on the Tuesday. So... I would play Sturridge potentially in the derby for just for Firmino's work rate against Burnley. I think we'll rely on his work rate a lot more in the derby. We, we, need, we need him to work hard. We need him to win the ball back. Sorry, um, against Burnley. So maybe the Sturridge situation is a conversation. Um, it's really, really tough. Of course, I want to be Everton more than anything. So I'm always like, like the other part of my brain is like saying, let's just get your best players on the pitch and, you know, let's just see if we can get, give them a hiding. Um, you know, and then worry about Burnley when it comes. Of course, the manager can't think like that. Um, but it'd be interesting to see what you guys think. Good storage. I'm a I'm a fan of his. Um, I think that uh, it was a complete shock to me when he came out this season and really uh, looked like a completely different player. For me, uh, since I hadn't really been watching um, in his earlier days, um, and so I'm I'm a fan of of him, and I think that he should he should get that opportunity, uh, especially 
like you said, we should we should be resting Bobby. Um and and he's he's not even been performing uh at his normal or at his past levels, I think. And so um yeah, I think Sturge deserves the opportunity. He's earned it, um, for sure. You probably watch Sturge a lot more than I have, Dave, too, but I feel mm-hmm. like compared to the old Sturge, he's <laughs> a lot more of a creator now than he used to be. I mean, obviously, our style of play has changed compared to when, you know, he was playing with, like, you know, Suarez and Sterling and stuff. But I feel like he has done a lot better in terms of, like, what sometimes Firmino does when, like, coming back to midfields, uh, you know, creating the space in front and, like, passing into those areas into, like, Salah and Mane and Shakiri. Yeah, Daniel, um, for me... I would put him up there with like Robbie Fowler and Michael Owen. It's probably one of the best finishes we've ever had. He's that good. When he first came in, his pace was frightening. And I think with the injuries, that's kind of cost him his pace. So he's had to adapt his game, um, with, with, which what top players do. I think that's what um, other people forget. Top players stay top because they adapt the game completely. Um, so, for example, you look at Cristiano Ronaldo. He used to be a flying left side winger. And now he's playing basically up front on like a number 10 role and he's trying to adapt. Steven Gerrard dropped back further on his career to like a number 6 role. So these kind of players do it. I think with Daniel, I think it's took him a lot longer to realise that his body cannot do what his brain's trying to, to ask him to do. About going where well, you can use your 5, 10 yards of pace to get past the defender. Um, when he had his best season, of course, was under Brendan um, in the 2013 season. But people forget that season that Brendan changed it to the three at the back. And he got Sturridge and Suarez up front together. He said, I'm just going to get my best players on the pitch and see what happens. And then Sterling came into the season, of course, and everything was great. But I think now, he's not, for me, he, does, he cannot play up front on his own. That's my only thing about him. He needs a partner. He needs a guy to do his work. Now, he, people forget as well, in that season, he had a couple of injuries around Christmas time, going into January. And Suarez works for you. So Suarez will do your running. And I think with Sturridge, I think with Mane, I think if you pulled Mane a bit closer to him to do his work and do his running, because he can't, not, he can't do it. But what he can do is if you get the ball into, into him inside the area, you know, I, I would put me out on any Liverpool player right now. If you're going through one-on-one with the goalkeeper, who would you want on the ball? It'd be Daniel Sturridge. There's just no danger. The man is unbelievable. So I just think, I think it's, I just think it's took him a lot longer to realise, hey, my, I'm a completely different player now. He's 29. Um, which actually I thought he was about 34 and then it's, same like, here he's been around forever it feels like <laughs> it's, he's been playing for like, for like City when he was like 17 and I, I just feel like I, I, a bit like the Michael Owen situation as well I, I, I quite mirror their careers in effect because I think they are very similar because the way they could finish the way they had pace and then Michael Owen was finished at 32 31 32 he was finished and the injuries caught up and I think with Daniel this season, I think, of course, he's in the last year of his contract as well. He's going to need games. He's going to need minutes. But I think he's earned that minutes. He came on yesterday and he was working hard yesterday as well. He's, you know, but can he do it for 90 minutes? And can, he, can we go to him twice in a week and go, Daniel, we need you now? Because we're getting to the end of, Jan- the end of December, start of January, and we have four games in like, you know, 11 days. Daniel, we need you now. We need you to go a game for us. And that's, the only, that's my only doubt with Sturridge. Is that I don't think he can. I don't think he can go again. I think he can go once a week. I think he can go once every 10 days. But I don't think we can go, hey, Daniel, we've got four or five games in the start of January, end of December. You know, we got City away, I think, on the first. I think maybe we go, we go and play on the third or the fourth. We need you now for the third or the fourth. And I don't think he can do that. But for the derby, of course, I would, I would just play him because he, he has scored against Everton. He's played well against Everton. And I know a lot of Everton fans who absolutely hate him. So it'll make my day even better if he scores against them. So that just makes my my Christmas is made already if that if that man scores the winner against them. So, you know, I can understand the situation. But no, I, you know, back to back to the main point. Really, I think I'd start Firmino you know, against Burnley because I think we need his work rate and I'd start Sturridge getting the derby. And I'd hope Mane and Sturridge Salah can try and do his work for him, really. I think that would be the ideal scenario in some ways where, you know, you start with storage, uh, get a healthy lead like we're hoping and, you know, be able to sub him out in 60, maybe, you know, slide Salah to the middle. And, you know, that's when you put Lalana in to get his yeah. minutes on the wing or something like that. But 
yeah, I think it all relies on the scoreline at the time. Which brings me to this point. I actually want to kind of talk about the Sun overcoming towards the end, but Klopp's hesitance in substitutions. Is it just me or it feels like it takes forever? Even a game like yesterday where it felt like we needed something. I mean, if if anybody went into halftime at 2-1 thinking, oh, if there was another 10 minutes in the first half, we were going to tie it, they weren't watching the game. So it wasn't like we turned something around. It was a you know little moment of brilliance by Mane's pace, a penalty. Okay, now we're kind of in the game. But it was obvious that we needed something else or we needed something changed. But we didn't see a change to, what was that, 65th, 70th, I believe, yesterday? By the time we saw a sub from mm-hmm. us in. Why yeah. do you just think that is? You can, you can, you can take this one, Hillary. <laughs> um, well, I've, I've had a, a bit of a thing, like, just sitting in the back of my head for, for most of this season um, was how, how are things going to be different, really different, uh, without uh, Buvak, and um, so, so whenever some something like that is kind of happening, or like some of these things where what are, what's being you know going on, his right hand man, um, and so I I don't know I don't know why he's waiting so long for the substitutions when it seems so obvious to everyone else watching the game. Like I that's what I kept thinking. I I kept looking at the clock in the. 62nd, 65th minute, like, when are we getting one? Um, it seems like it's been like that the entire time he's been at Liverpool. And in the past, my thought was, well, who are you going to put in? You know, you will look at the bench and, like, who's going to put in to come and save the game? There weren't that many options. Whereas I feel like now we have a, a, lot, a much better squad than what he took over. And there are options on the bench that can come and change the game, either spark things or move people around. And like I say, in the past, my assumption was, well, it's lack of options. What is he supposed to do? You know, you have your best 11 out there. This is pretty much it kind of deal. Whereas I feel now there are different, we can do different things. I mean, I'm not saying it might not be a better option, but it's a different option. So, but it feels like he's still very hesitant in changing. He He's more of a believer on changing how the people on the field do things as opposed to introducing somebody new who's going to bring something new to the game altogether. Yeah, I, for me, I, I think his biggest weakness sometimes can be his, his trust. I think he trusts the players a lot um, to stick to the game plan and get the job done. Of course, we see it from a different um, you know, perspective as the manager does. Um, that's why he gets paid a lot more money than we do. But, uh, you know, <laughs> I just think for me, I think that's his biggest weakness. It can be his trust. I think he goes, right, guys, you know, I've set up to do a game plan. I'm going to give you 15, 20 minutes in the second half to implement the game plan before I make any changes. Um, I think yesterday was a, a funny situation for him. I think he knows the Napoli score. And I think he thinks, well, what you do? Dude, if, you know, if Napoli go and score two, three more, you know, and you kind of, then you don't get the, you know, where Liverpool can win one nil, of course, in the next leg. Instead of just going to win by two clear goals, you don't get that situation where we all go through on goals scored. I think, I think yesterday he was in a funny situation. Um, I think he also thinks that the subs. I I I would have touched Genie Wijnaldum at half time. That was my thing. I I think he was on the booking, and I would have went. He's playing within himself. Let's just take him off now. But that doesn't. That's not Klopp's kind of thinking really. Um, throughout the season, it's hard to criticise him because. People seem to forget we are undefeated in the league. Um, we've conceded five all season, you know, in the league. We haven't conceded at home, I don't think, for like in the league for like what a year now or something, or like 12, 13 games. And we conceded at home in the league. Mm-hmm. So we conceded once Cardiff, I think. Um, I think Cardiff ended that run. So we, you know, it's just the Champions League games we, uh, away from home, which is kind of flattered to deceive. And I think the substitutions could have been a massive. Um, a massive choice if he if he made the sub on the fifty five or the sixtieth, and goes you go and get thirty minutes to change the game for me. I just think yesterday he was in a really funny situation with the Napoli game. I don't think you know you know he was kind of weighing up his options. I think he might might have, might have waited too long, you know, to change the game. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because I actually thought you know knowing that scenario, 
we would come out in the second half saying we got nothing to lose. So mm-hmm. let's go all out at it because either way we have to beat Napoli. Like even if we you know get scored on or whatever the case happens, we got to go beat Napoli either way. I figured we would go for it in the second half. And because when we you know when we started with that eleven, obviously you said, okay, we're gonna sit still and you know hope to get one with the Gullit boys up front. Um, mm-hmm. But then at you know at halftime you're losing. Obviously you're not really clicking as well mm-hmm. i thought we would go all out and say hey we're gonna have to win the last game anyway even if you lose over here it is what it is but he kind of like he kind of went your route where he was like uh let's see what happens because honestly a draw from yesterday was not gonna gain us anything anyway no exactly and i think that's what i think that's another thing that he's thinking i think but now with the, with us getting beat 2-1 and it sounds crazy but he does have the option to win one nil you know, which that's true. That's true. Exactly, if we were to do yesterday, we still have to win one nil to go through. So it didn't really matter anyway. You know, but now he has that option to win one nil, um, because of, of course the Napoli goal, um, sorry the Red Star goal and whatever it's been, um, with the head to head. So if Liverpool draw two two yesterday, we still need to beat Napoli. So even if we lost, we still need to beat Napoli. We just need to beat them one nil or by two clear goals. Okay, you take out that we can be still beat Napoli two one or three two, but that's going to be very unlikely. You can't play, or oh, well, what's okay now? Because we can, you know, do what you do. Do you think the other thing that we have to think of is we're we're second in the league, we're two points behind, and we got for me the biggest game of the season, or one off on the weekend. Do you think? Well, do you bring Shakiri on or Kaita? I know we brought them on, you know, fifteen twenty minutes to go to try and change it. Do you think? Well, are they, them two are going to be my starting eleven on the weekend, and I want them. You know the, the the most stress as they can because we can't still afford to lose here. You know I think he was in a really t- I think he was in a really really tight spot yesterday to make that decision. Do you guys feel he sees the he now understands the importance a bit more and he sees the Everton game as a more important game compared to the past. In the past, it sounded like it felt more like I mean he realized the derby and the importance of it, but. To him personally, it was still just a league game. And I believe that when he said it, that to him, it was just another game. Do you think he understands a bit more now? Like you're saying, I mean, they could beat Everton and get immunity for like three months. <laughs> yeah. Well, for me, it's. I think he realizes that was second in the league, two points off, one of the best teams to ever play football. I'm not saying that lightly. Uh, we're saying that's probably the best team to ever play in the Premier League. You know, with two points behind them. So, for example, if Jurgen Klopp goes and gets 94 points this season and we don't win the league, is he a failure for winning 31 games? I don't think, you know, what can you do? And I think he thinks we have a chance here. I think, you know, it's the best chance we've I've ever had. I'm, you know, I'm 26 and it's the best team I've seen. You know, we had false stones under Rafa Benitez. I am. Um, we had false stones under. Brendan Rodgers when the foundations were built on sand in effect and I think this time I think he realises hey you know we have a big chance and I think also with the Everton game I think he didn't realise the backlash he got out of wrestling the players last year of course Calvert-Lewin gets the late penalty they score, Rooney scores the late penalty we draw 1-1 if you go and win the game 1-0 you look like a genius and I appreciate that but that's football you know if Liverpool go and win the Champions League final Lollis Parry is still in goal so <laughs> you know that's yeah. football. You know, it's, it, you, you live and die by your decisions. And I don't think he realised the criticism he got last season when, until he rested the players. I think he, he got in. And I don't know, I think it was the Sunday or the Monday. I think he must have looked around and thought, oof, you know, I've made a big one here. And I'm going to have to really bounce this back for them. Which, of course, he did, you know. So I think he kind of thinks to himself as well, I owe the fans one. You know, we owe them a big performance. We owe them, especially one against Everton again, you know, with all the controversy last year. Of course, he, and he ripped that wrong against in the FA Cup when we beat him in the FA Cup with Van Dijk. He kind of ripped that wrong. But I think this, I think last year especially, still riles on him um, with how Calvert-Lewin got the penalty, you know, with the you know supposed dive or the supposed tackle, whatever you want to look at it. You know, Liverpool, Liverpool didn't play well that game. I think he owes us one. So I think that might be in the back of his mind as well. I think I still put the blame on that game to Mane for not passing right before the halftime. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, Still I, love my, my. I hold grudges, Hillary. You know me. And and if that ball went in, I mean, that's Everton well, team was looking to be demolished. When and, you when you when you said something about Mane earlier, I said we should we should do a drinking game, take a shot every time he <laughs> takes a shot at Mane. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I mean, I love money, and especially this year, I honestly think he's still like right now to me overall. And I know I think Salah has more goals or whatever, but I think Mane has been probably the most exciting. What I mean, I get a lot more excited when Mane has the ball right now than anybody else out of the front three. I just feel like deep down inside, he's too mm. much of a forward at times and goes for the spectacular or goes for the goal as opposed to looking to pass. And that was just like a prime example, but that was like one of the many. But that was like a very blatant one that I felt cost us the game at the time. Because, like I say, if that game became 2-0, it felt like it was just going to go downhill and it was going to be a good old Everton trashing. Uh, and then it stayed at 1-0, and when you let somebody hang in like that, you know, the ref can give the game away like they did. So, yeah. So, as we come to a close... Let me guys let me get a prediction this way. So out of these next two games before our new podcast, out of the possible six points, are we getting all six? Yes. Yeah. Very hesitant. Yeah. Yes. So. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just always the derby. It always hurts. You know, I you know we got this record of like nineteen ninety nine, and you know, then the last Beatles at Anfield and. It it always riles me. I know one day it's gonna come. It's all about when. <laughs> it's just like so. You know, you know it's coming. You know it's coming. It's just like I I, I go into these games now, just going, don't lose. Just keep this record and feel going forever. Please don't lose. I know it's on <laughs> one day we are gonna lose, but not this weekend. No, but we're, we're too good at home. We're too good. So you feel like out of the two games, the Everton one is the riskier one, just because of the overall like derby paranoia, or just because I, they're actually the better people. I, th- I think Burnley's the harder game. I'm not saying that because of like the bitterness or you know or the biasness. I'm just saying I- I've seen Everton come so many times with really good sides, by the way, sides that were better than Liverpool at certain t- at certain points. Um, Martinez had a really good side when he came, and they fatted to the sieve. We scored early, and we just ran all over them. And I c- I've got a feeling that can happen again. Um, I've got a feeling if we score in the first ten minutes. You know, it could be an American football score, basically. You know, and it, we could put, you know, you can put four, five, six past them. And then, you know, the world's your oyster. And, and, and that's why I think the Burnley game's had it. Burnley, I promise you, on a Tuesday night, on the in the cold when it's raining, and you've got to get up for this game, and this, the pitch is so narrow and they're, they're so intense, that is going to be a horrendous game. If Liverpool scored two that game, I'd be amazed. We'll have to go and win the game 1-0. And it'll be a horrible goal off a corner or something like that. Off an awful set piece, which we've been taking all season. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. It'll go off a defender and go in. And uh, like like the Clavang game last year, it was just a horrible game, nasty game. And then Clavang scores late on, and I think that's what it's going to be like again. So no, I'd say the Burnley game's tougher. So you're saying six out of six to Hillary? Yeah, I think so. And which one is the easier three, the Burnley game or the Everton game? Um, I I really don't know uh, which one would be t- easier. Um, I f- I just uh, if I had to say one, um, probably yeah. Pro- I, I don't know. Probably Everton. I don't know. I, think, I, I think the Burnley away game scares me more than Everton at home because, like, I think, like, you know, like what they were saying, I feel like Everton will come to play, uh, which kind of like works for us. Uh, whereas Burnley plays to not make you play in a way, uh, to mm-hmm. stop you from playing. That's their goal, usually. Um, that's, and that's teams we struggle the most against. And that's when we need probably our most, like, physical lineup out there for those games so i mean that's a game that you know robertson has to be out there logan has to be out there you know that's probably boring but tough midfield has to be out there uh mm-hmm. 
because that's usually those Burnley games are just like ugly fights more than soccer games. So, yeah. Anything else you guys want to touch before we wrap things up here? Don't know. I'm any... reaching for a Pulisic fight, but we never got to that. No, we can we can say it if you like. It's up to, entirely up to you. I'm ready yeah. when you are. <laughs> I've, got the, I've, got, I've got my gloves. I've got my stats. I'm ready to go. <laughs> I we had the referee whistle and everything to make the calls on this fight, but uh, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> what does the when does it start? Is it January first? Like I know it's January, but is it January first? Yeah. Okay. January first, yeah, it starts. Um yeah, I don't I don't think that transfer is gonna happen in January. I don't think it'll happen in January. I think I think that's a summer transfer, but you know, I think it is a transfer that Liverpool have to go for. Just have to go for. For seventy? Don't get I, me started this late. Forget forget <laughs> Right, forget the money for a second, okay? Hear me out. Forget the money. Forget. Let's let's look at the player and his ability, and look what Jurgen Klopp can do with him. The man is twenty years old. Actually, I'm not, he's not even a man. The child is twenty years old, and he's been playing in the Champions League for three, four years, two, three, no, well, two, three years at a top, top club. I, 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 we have ability. Can use both feet. This is a man, by the way, who ran us ragged in preseason, in my opinion. So. I, I, I cannot, I don't see the arguments. People look and say Van Dyke was a lot of money, but does he look like a lot of money now? Does Alison Becker look like a lot of money now? I, it, it, it's okay. So, because, it, for but example, can you come... measure the risk level of Pulisic with those two examples you just gave? We knew exactly what we were getting. It wasn't a project we were getting. We were getting a top goalie. We were getting a top defender in the Premier League when we got those two guys. And that's why I'm kind of looking at the money, because not only for this scenario, but for any other players you're going to sign or re-sign or whatever the case might be, I just think like the risk was not there with the other two signings where we spent a ton of money on. We knew exactly what we were getting. Whereas the money, the, a roll of dice. The money should not be an issue because if like whatever his you think his price should be, the, the money, <laughs> the amount of Americans who are going to go buy... Holistic yeah. merchandise is going to make up for it. Um, the minute he signs for them, I'm buying like everything with his name on it. Yeah. So, I think that's the thing. If we sign him for that money, I think we're not paying him that money. We're just more paying the marketing concept that money. You know, we're that's 30 to you and 40 to your marketing concept kind of a deal to me. If they sign him, spend that much on him. Because I just don't feel the player itself is worth that. If it was the guy from Luxembourg, would we pay 74? But he's not, though. But, this is the thing. He's not. He's but, a man. He's playing at the top I'm of the German league. Players, though. Like, if it was... A, okay. If it was... If, it, if his passport was a, any other country, would he be worth 70? Unless he's yes. Chinese or something, which is, like, you know, billions. But, you know, like, if he's just from, like, a small country, or, hey, hey make him yeah. from Turkey, for God's sakes, would he Come be on. worth seven? So he, yeah. was, he was, he's one of the, he's ranked one of the top young players in Europe. He was on that golden boy list with um, Trent, and he was, he was on the longer list, but he was on the list, and he's, he's ranked one of the top five or six young players in the Bundesliga. Um, I mean, he's not, He's. it's not just, the hype isn't just because he's an American. No, I agree. I, couldn't no, agree I more. understand that. I'm saying, but the price tag is what, more. What, what, is, what is the price? The price is 70 million pounds. Okay. Neymar changed football. People forget that. He completely changed football. Money is not an issue. Everton just spent fifty million pounds on Richarlison. Are you t- are you cannot tell me that Pulisic is not a better player than Richarlison? Okay, Richarlison's had a good twelve games. He started well. I'm not arguing with that. Pulisic, you can say okay, he's in and out the side because of Jaden Sancho. That's fair enough. But players are inconsistent when they're that young. We're talking about a twenty year old man with like all the ability to be anything he wants to be, with a manager who can get most out of every single player he's ever managed. For example, he took Oxley Chamberlain out of Arsenal. For bearing in mind, the only reason why he got him for 35 million is because he was in the last year of his contract. Right? Yeah. He took this man, he was playing he played right wing back. He 
made him in six months and been one of the best number eights in the world. And look what we've done with him. And we're talking about a guy now, £70 million. Pound. He's 20 years old. He's just turned 20 in September. He, I, I don't understand. I, I don't get it, our man. So look at if you if you go went through the, for example the list of the top ten players on the Golden Boy Award at uh, the Golden Boy Award, how many are, probably all of, them, all of them are probably worth around seventy million, because you could be at your club for ten years, and then he's worth he's got you've got your money out of him. I, I, for me, it's a no-brainer. It really is. I can't. I don't even see the conversation and not taking him. The, the money's not an issue. People go, oh well, he's not going to start. He doesn't need to start. Why can't he sit on our bench like Riyad Mahrez does or Leroy Sane does? Like they sit on their bench, or Alexis Sanchez does, or Anthony Martial, like they do. But Liverpool it, need to be that strong. Yeah, but I mean, okay, like the example you gave, like Alexis Sanchez, I mean, I would consider that a miserable transfer. Yeah, but he's still a, yeah, but he's still when a dangerous player. That much but, money, and the other thing is, Sanchez is 29. Yeah, but Sanchez is older. He's a lot older. And he doesn't have the ability. Or the manager. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. No, I'm not comparing the players. I'm comparing in terms of the concept of yeah. spending that much money and having them, you know, warm up the bench. But that's what they're meant to be. If Liverpool needs a challenge on all four fronts, which we want them to do, we want them to win all four trophies, Liverpool need the biggest one. We went to the Champions League final with Dom Solanke on the bench. Now, no disrespect to the man, but he's no Christian Pulisic. Look at, look at the subs that he made. OK, fair enough, he had a couple of injuries in the final. He brought, off, he brought on an unfit Tadam Nalana and an unfit Emre Chan. They were our two subs. Why can't we bring Christian Pulisic on? And the, people, the other people seem to think as well, when we signed Mo Salah, people were going, well, he's going to be a backup to Mane. That was the exact conversation. Why we signed him? He'll be a backup to Mane. No, he was that good. We, we, we accompany Mane and we're playing Salah in his position. People forget that, that when Mane first came in, he played right wing. And then we played Salah there now because Salah was a better player. So you go to Pulisic, you're going to get 25 games off the bench. But then you've got to go and take Mane's spot. Or you've got to go and take Salah's spot. Because if Salah goes on and scores a hat-trick for Mane's position, then he's in. Would Liverpool need a bigger squad? For me, it's a no-brainer. For a 20-year-old player, who can use both feet, quick, talented. For me, it's an absolute no-brainer. It really, I can't, I don't even understand the conversation of not taking him. Forget money, it's not about it. For me, it's about the player that you get signing these days. And I think when you look at people like Mbappe going for 180 million, and you look at Neymar going for 270, you look at Dembele going to Barcelona for the, I think it was 120. So might quote me for wrong. Coutinho was 147. You know, I think it's a no-brainer, really do. But didn't you think that Coutinho's price was ridiculously over, over the top? I mean, I I couldn't believe they paid yeah. that much for him. Oh yeah, he he signed, I love Coutinho. He had just signed a new contract. Mm-hmm. That was a lot. A lot of the inflation was because of the. There was like five years on his contract still. But the thing is, though, Liverpool went to Barcelona. People, people look at the Coutinho deal by saying it was overinflated. Of course, it was. But Liverpool knew that they got two hundred, um, two hundred seventy million for Neymar in the summer. And Liverpool were like, "Well, we know you got the money, so why, why can't we demand a premium?" That's, that's, that's another thing that's frustrated well, Liverpool for years. Especially yeah, the fans. That was, that was great business, definitely. Yeah, because they've, they've just got a 270 million. You can't say they can't come. Barcelona can't come with their hands out going, we haven't really got a lot of money, like Oliver Twist. We know you've got 270 million, mate. You've got to get your hand in your pocket to play the premium for our best player in the middle of the season. Because that was the other thing. They wants to sign him in January. If you want him in January, you've got to pay the top dollar because it's January. And you pay that premium. So for me, the Pulis for 70 million. And I'm not saying only because it is, of course, it's a horrendously amount, a lot of money. But when you look at the market, with Gilfie Sigurdsson going for 47 and Richarlison for 50, and these players are playing, no disrespect to Everton, but they're not really a top six club. If you look at Lacazette going for 53 and Aubameyang going for over 60 million, you know, I'll be talking about a 20 year old kid who has all the potential in the world. For, you know, Mbappe's 19. You know, okay, he might be a bit of a freak nature because he's so good, but, you know, Pulisic has all the ability, not okay, not to be as good as him, but the ability to play at a top top level for 10, 12 years, you know, and he could change the U.S. national team in an instant. He can make actually make the competitive, because that's one thing that the U.S. national team hasn't been for a while is competitive, and this man is actually the shine in life for me to come in and for the next 10 years for kids to expire to be 12, 13 year olds now playing around in the park or playing for school. He's he's the man. He is it. 
And I think if you put him at a top club, I think you've given that manager the world's oyster. Really do. Yeah, I think. Go ahead, go ahead, Hillary. Well, I think that Jose Mourinho is my american u.s men's national team feelings aside and my my feelings aside on wanting my my, one of my favorite u.s players to play for liverpool i also shudder at the idea of if he goes to another team and he's playing against us i would rather have him with us than against us and so all of the the points that he's just that you've just made about how great he is they're they're gonna be there. He's always gonna be, you know, yeah. barring anything bad happening or you know him getting benched all the time. Uh, he he's gonna go somewhere. I really just would prefer it for yep. you know that we never have to play him and that he's on he's with our team. Um, because that's my biggest fear is that he might go somewhere and get that development, get that extra push yeah. and. and and be some like pick the the like he goes to Man United, and then yeah. he's there because that's his favorite team. But he's there for like eight years. I don't see that anything good happening under Jose with him. But you know, that's my worst nightmare is yeah. him playing, playing for them. So I would just, yeah. and then that's not even bringing in the U.S. men's national team discussion. But I I think that um. Yeah, I mean, he's just, there's something special about him. I don't know how you don't see it. <laughs> it's just, I, 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 Tim, I understand your point. I really do about the money, and I understand that issue. My issue is, right now, is Christian Pulisic right now good enough to make our bench? Yes. Is he good enough to get minutes for Liverpool right now? Yes. The man is 20 years old. If he's good enough now, how good is he going to be in five years? We're not buying Christian Pulisic for now. We're buying him for three or four or five years. This is a long-term plan with the man. But is he, all I'm saying is, is he good enough right now to get minutes for Liverpool? Yes, 100%. 100%. And that's my that's my thing on it. If you're getting a 20-year-old kid who's good enough to play for you now, where is he going to be in five years? So, it's, uh, yeah, I'm Team Hillary, and come on, we're going to sign Pulisic. We're gonna have Come to on, Tim. To Come podcast. to the dark side, Tim. I know you want We're to. We're gonna have to dedicate a podcast in December just to the January signing market. Like I say, my main point on that. I mean, like I say, I like the player. I like the potential. I feel like, and I understand the whole money thing thanks to the freaking Neymar. But I would like. When we're spending that much money, I would want to guarantee that that guy is gonna be good. And gonna yeah. perform, especially in the Premier League. Like when you mentioned a player like Richarlison. I think, yeah, I mean, that was a lot for him, but he had already shown that he can do it in the Premier League, which is a totally different ball game. I mean, especially compared to the German League. But like I say, I, I mean, I love, I mean, I like watching the kid. He has loads of potential. Um, I just don't know if it's worth the money in terms of like what he brings to the team in terms of like on the field. Mm-hmm. Off the field, I understand the money part of it, and it makes a lot more sense. It almost makes it look like you're getting in for like 20, 30, because, yeah, by the time the guy lands in Liverpool, you will sell enough jerseys in the U.S. to pay the difference. But, like I say, I, I would like, I mean, we were talking about Fakir before the season started, and what was the number, like 50 million? Yeah, 50, 60, I think, so on there. Yeah, and I obviously he's a lot older, but it was going to be somebody that was going to come in, start, and make a huge difference right off the bat. I think, and I, I, I agree, but I think with the Fakir one, I think, I don't think the Pulisic deal happens if Fakir signs. I don't think it's even a discussion. But the problem is, Fakir's knee is made out of Laffy Taffy. So that kind of, it's, you know, <laughs> he hasn't got a knee. The man hasn't, you know, so... For me, for Pulisic, it's all right. Then here's my here's my thing on it. If he goes to Juventus, say, or Roma, Napoli, he goes and gets twelve goals and gets seven assists in his first season. How much is he worth then? Hundred million, hundred and ten. Because that's the kind of level that we're talking about. Because the man's so young. This is the thing. People think with the, the Mbappe situation, he's kind of the same age, of course, different player. Um, but he's not getting forty goals a season. 50 goals a season like Messi, Ronaldo, Salah was last year. He wasn't doing that. They've signed 180 million on a, a guy who's got the potential to do that. Like what we'll be doing. 
we're signing a guy for 70 million who's right now still good enough for us potentially to be at the level of the seller of your Suarez, of of the elite. Now, just for me, I I, I clarify players in two brackets. I clarify elite. I cl- then well, I clarify Ronaldo and Messi in another world of their own. But then the rest in like an elite level and then world class level, like for example, Salah, Neymar, you know, Suarez, they're elite. And this man has got the potential to be in that elite level in three four years with the right tutelage of Klopp and how we play football in our attack. I think honestly. Honestly, I think, it, and as Hillary said, I think it could really come back to haunt us. If he goes to City, we have an issue. Liverpool, honestly, we have a humongous issue. Because right now, they're bringing Sane and Mahrez off the bench. And, they, of course, they have Aguero, Jesus, Sterling. We need that extra attacking player. We need it. He took a chance on, um, on Shaqiri, and it's worked out. It's working out, I should say. It's working out. Now it's time to go one more, go big. And let's get the front five settled for five years. So if he is worth 70, what is Sancho worth right now, you guys think? Jaden? Well, they've got to think, though, but Jaden Sancho, hasn't he played 13 games? Oh, could you sign for 45 million now? Yeah, probably. Yeah. He's English. 45 million, 50 million. We should play 13 games. You know, that's all we're in. Or maybe they played a bit more, but we're 13 games into a season. So that's all he's played. He's played a third of a season. This guy's been playing for two years. Okay, yeah, he's in and out the squad, but you're going to get that with young players. You know, Trent at the start of the season has been in and out the squad. We all know he's a top, top right back, but you're going to get inconsistencies. All I'm, all I'm saying is it, it's all about timing. So, we, we, as again, you, you touched on the Sanchez deal before. The Alexis Sanchez and Mourinho deal was just a nightmare waiting to happen. It was just a nightmare. It was a nightmare from start to finish, and it's, it's worked out that way. And with this manager, with his ability, with the way we play football, with the global outreach that Liverpool are trying to do in America, it's just all, it all seems to me a match made in heaven. Don't look at his stats right now. Look at his stats for the next five years. Mbappe's stats were not great. Look at his stats for the next five years. And that's what we're going to we're kind of need to build towards, really. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to listen to this podcast again later and like really think about this. <laughs> Come to the dark side. Wait over here. Come to the Pulisic star side. That's awesome. We talk about other US greats like Landon Donovan and Brian McBride. Come on. <laughs> Come on. I'm so not sold. But if we, I, if we sign like, Nori Sarkin back, you'd be sold. You, I would have to look at some of these other guys that I can think of on top of my head and see like what their market value comes up as. Like To me, I understand the investment part of it on the young player. And the guy does have a huge potential. I feel like we will be paying too high for potential and like you say i understand the whole part of him like going somewhere else and his price almost probably doubling after a good season there if he goes to like the italian league or if he comes to i mean at this point in his career i don't think he would sign for a smaller team anyway because he's got the name he's yeah you know uh but yeah i mean i can see his price doubling and everything but i mean wouldn't we get knowing Klopp, i would almost rather have him pick a couple of dudes maybe that are not as known young talents for a lot less than invest. Because I think that puts a lot of pressure on him too to come to Liverpool with that price tag. For a young kid like that, yeah. that's a lot of load to carry. I mean, those are things that I would worry about. Going to a new country, which at least language is not a problem, obviously, but going to a totally different league in terms of like the style of soccer and going with the pressure of having that price tag on your head. As I like mean, he would be the fifth or sixth most expensive guy on the team, really, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. He has the hopes and dreams of every American football yeah. fan on his shoulders as well. <laughs> <laughs> He's been yeah. carrying a lot so far. I'm not really sure if that would add, that would add I, some pressure, but I, I I feel like he could handle it. It's nothing. I think, I think the main point as well that we're all forgetting here, all right, and that a lot of people are forgetting. You don't think Jürgen Klopp's been on, uh, um, on the phone to the coaches in Dortmund and went, what do you think? Is he the real deal? And they haven't said, oh, yeah, he's the real deal. He has it all. You don't think he's still got friends there? And, he, and he's, still, he's still got the ability to call people or text people and go, what do you think of him? And they went, he's the real deal. He's got it all. He's got the potential to be anything he wants to be. And, I, and we, we forget that part. You know, Liverpool fans are forgetting that part. The, what Klopp, the Klopp's connection with Dortmund and all probably knows every coach there. And still going, what do you think? 
You know, you've seen him since he was what, 17, 16, whatever, whatever, how long he's been there. What do you think? And I, I think that's where if Liverpool sign him, I think that's what Klopp's taken his big key from as well. It's what them coaches have said to him. With this connection there. Point. Yeah, he definitely has a lot more connections than, for example, Chelsea would, which mm-hmm. apparently, supposedly, is our biggest competition in signing. Yeah, I, I can't, I can't see Chelsea happening. The only way Chelsea take players off Liverpool is the London connection. Because players want to live in London. That's the only thing I can see. But I think with Klopp, I think if it comes down to it, I think he could pick up the phone to the, you know, the board of directors or whatever it's got to be, the chief exec, and go, come on, you don't me one of you. You know, how much is it be? How much is the table? And I think he has that bit more of an open discussion, you know. Um, so, yeah, I do think the, Klopp, the Klopp's key here with the connection to Dortmund. I don't think, that, I don't think it's um, fresh air. I do think it's solid interest. I do think there's been solid conversations. And I think the only way those conversations have been is with Klopp talking to the coaches as well before it's even kicked off. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, the having kind of the connections could be huge. Mm-hmm. He's come to our side, Hillary. Come on, yes. Well, you guys, you guys keep working on. You guys keep working on signing him. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll, we'll keep hoping on getting the three points until January, and then yeah. see what happens. I mean, the, obviously, it would not help if we beat Napoli and stay in the Champions League. Most of these players that are being talked about would be not able, would not be able to play in the Champions League for us anyway because they're already in there. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yes. Yeah, so mm-hmm. I'll come up with some names. Maybe we can sign instead that can play in the Champions League. You never know. We'll see what happens. Uh, yeah, we'll see that. I'm gonna definitely think about it. You guys <laughs> <laughs> making some good points. That I, now that I'm living here, and yeah, I know like my daughter would love to have him on Liverpool. So. We'll see. So, if he does so, sign, you guys have got a very expensive Christmas coming up <laughs> <laughs> with all the new jerseys. <laughs> Actually, just uh, picked her up a, a Liverpool jersey today for Christmas. So, already oh, started nice. shopping going on. So, <laughs> okay. Well, hopefully, cool. when we meet on Tuesday, we'll be six points richer and things will be a lot better. Maybe we get a client signed meeting or something. We'll make sure he's alive and we'll be back on Tuesday. Thank you. you. Take care. Have a great day. Bye-bye.